Well, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Motas Atala. He's a professor and chair in advanced materials processing at the University of Birmingham. Um, his research focuses on developing a metallurgical understanding of the material process interaction in advanced manufacturing of metallic materials, focusing on the process impact on the microstructure and structural integrity development. Um, he has co-authored over 100 on eight um, applications. So without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to Mota. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is my uh, second time to give a talk for the Alloy Design Group at Imperial, so I'm very pleased uh, to do so. Uh, today I'll be presenting the work of um, my PhD student, Bonnie Attard, who is, um, has almost finished her PhD, um, which is co-supervised by my colleagues, uh, Sam Crutchley and Yu Long Chu. Uh, the topic is on microstructural control in laser powder bed fusion. Uh, to create functionally graded Inquinal 718 super alloy microstructures. So um, going straight into the topic, what, what do you mean by functional grading or uh, tailored microstructures? Yeah, and people have, for quite some time in material science have been thinking about the concept of grading the properties. If you have, for instance, a structure exposed to high temperature at one end, low temperature at another end, can you find the structure where we buy have, for instance, columnar grains at one end and um, uh, for in, or fine grain at one end, for instance, to give us tensile strength and low cycle fatigue. And then on the other end, we have coarse grains to give us creep and fatigue crack growth resistance. That idea is, is extremely interesting in material science. People have done it using different materials. So people try to grade, for instance, from one alloy, let's say from titanium alloy into another alloy like a niobium or a molybdenum alloy. But then what if we can do that functional grading by additive manufacturing? Uh, that will be the cost, the, basically the concept of what we're trying to do in, in, in this work. So uh, is there a potential application? In fact, in fact, there are already uh, applications that use dual microstructures, as they call them. And th that example is the so-called dual micro microstructure disk. And what you see is that in these dual microstructure disks you have in the center region, which is exposed to more fatigue loads, you have height fine grains, so height and size strength, and that can give you also low uh, cycle fatigue strength. And then on the external part, you have much coarser grains. Uh, and these coarser grains, of course, are better from a creep resistance. And this is where the hot end is at, at the other end. Now, this is achieved through a very complex heat treatment and forging schedule. So you plan your forging, you plan your heat treatments in order to be able to achieve the dual microstructure so that you can tailor it to different locations. Now, additive manufacturing gives us the potential to do this in a more effective way because we have a control on the grain size at its very early stages, actually, during solidification. And of course, the, the, the famous GR diagram that, that people see in additive manufacturing, where you have a thermal gradient at one end on the y-axis, the solidification rate on the x-axis, where the G times R these is the cooling rate essentially. So what we can see is that you can change the type of uh, microstructural growth from columnar to equiax to cellular to planar based on playing with the cooling rates and also playing with the thermal gradient and solidification rates. And this is the way the core of what we're trying to do. And people call this the holy grail of additive manufacturing. If we can use the process at this stage to be able to give us um, the grain structure we want in order to get the properties we want at a very early stage. Now, people have done microstructure control in different ways. So in electron beam, uh, uh, Suresh Babu and his colleagues, they uh, used electron beam where they changed the scanning strategy and they changed the points between the heat sources in where they were working using the RCAM system to generate the word DOE, essentially, you know, just to get more money from them. And then uh, we have done something similar using direct laser deposition. This is the uh, work of my PhD student, Lakshmi Parimi, where she uh, used direct laser deposition. And in that case, she changed the laser power to achieve fully columnar grains out of Inconel 718 or 
fine columnar equiax type microstructure using also the same alloy in 718. So in theory, for the same alloy, you can generate coarse grains if you want. You can generate fine grains if you want. The only factor here that you can play, or the, one of the factors you can play with is the power. But of course, there are too many factors to play with in order to generate that controlled microstructure. Now, <clears throat> in powder bed fusion, the number of papers are a little bit less. So um, there is one paper by uh, a group in, uh, in Holland where they uh, used, uh, in this case, uh, the heat input, the, the laser power, basically. So they changed the laser power from one end where they had much finer grains and then they moved into higher heat input, 950 watt to give a much coarser grain, then back again to give a finer grain. So the heat input was here a good, you know, uh, parameter to uh, to be able to control the microstructure and to give that dual microstructure by by the heat input in powder bed fusion. So the question is, <clears throat> nobody has looked into the scanning parameters. So scanning strategy is one of the important parameters that control the properties and behavior in additive manufacturing. And also the concept of the energy density, um, the variations in energy density can also give uh, an important uh, influence on the microstructure as I'll show you in, in, in this work. Now, the problem is that in, in, in additive manufacturing, the control of the microstructure is, a, is a, an outcome of very complex interactions. The physics of the process <clears throat> is too, too sophisticated to be explained by the classical theories. We are playing with issues like melt pool turbulence. If you give too much heat, that can induce nucleation, can cause grains of different sizes to form. Heat transfer modes can, can, can be very complex to explain sometimes where you can move from conduction to keyholing. In fact, you can still get keyholing and conduction for samples made by the same energy density. Although it's the same energy density, you can get completely different microstructures and different even consolidation behavior. The nucleation events that happen in, in additive manufacturing can be complex because you have also surrounding to the liquid, there are loads of powders floating around and flying around. So that can also cause you know, nucleation events to happen while you're trying to make something in that process. Um, there is obviously heat accumulation and remelting events. Every time you, you build the layer, you are remelting the layer below. In fact, we find sometimes that we remelt up to 10 layers below the 20 or 30 micron layer we are adding. So that there are very complex interactions that are way different from what we see in casting or other techniques. Cooling rates are, of course, way uh, you know faster than what we can see in any other manufacturing technology. But potentially, maybe maybe similar to split casting. Our estimate is that it's one million degree per second, which is which is quite fast, of course. So the classical theories they sometimes do not apply here in what we're trying to explain. Finally, scanning strategies. I I will talk about that in details, but it's it's one of the things that we need to keep in mind when we try to use additive manufacturing. And that's because the scanning strategies to date are not physics inspired, they are not science inspired, they are only geometry uh, inspired by the manufacturer of the different additive manufacturing platforms. So the aim of this study is essentially to manipulate the microstructure and its gradation through microstructure engineering using laser powder bed fusion. Now, how we do this? First of all, we try to find a processing window for Inconel 718. Inconel 718 is a nice alloy in additive manufacturing literature because you can find a lot of parameters where it will give you good density. Typically, people in the past would do the optimization and then once they find a condition that has very high density, very low porosity, they would say, oh, that's the optimum condition and they will stop. What we have done this time is that we found more than one condition that will give us high density and then we compare them to each other as I'll show you uh, later. Second factor is that we look into the influence of the parameters and the scanning strategies on the texture. So we try to see how the texture evolves after we make all of these samples, how it evolves, how it affects the microstructure, how it affects the solidification um, structure as well. So that basically gives us an idea about how in a dense condition, we can get variations between one condition and another. The fourth parameter is that now once we can obtain samples with good density, but with different microstructures, we try to look into the mechanical behavior of these graded microstructures 
uh, through the use of digital image correlation. And I'll give some, some pre-results on that. Second thing is that to look into the uh, influence of microstructural grading in, in high temperature conditions of testing. This is a little bit pending, so I'll give some glimpse of that. And then finally, look into the effect of grading on the oxidation behavior of the material. And that's an important factor that we, we can also consider by this approach. So the work was done on our uh, concept laser M2, which is the, the workhorse of, of our lab. Um, the powder was conventional gas atomized Inconel 718 powder, nice spherical powder. The initial experiment was had a target of finding as many conditions as possible that have high density. So we scanned a wide range of laser powers, wide range of scanning speed, hatch spacing, and so on. And the, the nominal condition is what we call the uh, island perpendicular strategy. So what typically does is that the laser would scan, as you can see, on layer one. And then when it goes into layer two, it will flip the laser, the scanning direction, okay, and uh, will continue based on that. I'll show it, I'll show it in a second. Uh, we kept a constant island size, right? And uh, a layer thickness of 30 microns um, was kept constant as well for all our trials. Now, all of these parameters can, can be applied in this equation called the energy density, where you can have the area energy density is the laser power divided by the scan speed times the scan spacing. There is also another version, which is millimeter cube, where you have to divide also on the layer thickness. But because we kept the layer thickness constant, so we are sticking only to the uh, area energy density, joule per millimeter square. So the energy density itself is <clears throat> something that people in the literature, they, they use mainly as a rough processing window, a rough estimate to find where we are, where we should be. If your energy density is too low, that indicates that you probably have, you're going to have a lack of melting or lack of consolidation. If it is too high, then you're going to have keyholing and evaporation. So it's quite good to find, you know, the, the, the processing window that you're looking at. Um, it doesn't really distinguish the individual effect of the parameters. As I said, you can have two conditions having the same energy density, but still they both have completely different microstructure. And in some cases, even completely different consolidation behavior. It also doesn't account for the scan strategy or island parameters or anything of that sort. So it's it's a little bit different in the way it behaves and it's it's only good as a rough estimate, but I'll show you how we used it in this work. Now, back to the scanning strategy. So most, machine, most machines, they use proprietary scan strategies. The aim of these scanning strategies, as people call them, they say they are used to reduce the residual stresses or sometimes to improve the microstructural homogeneity. That's what people say. So there are different types of, of scanning strategies. Each machine has its own clever way. So uh, there's the island scanning, like what I'm showing here in A, that's that's the common one we use in, in, in Birmingham, where you have one layer, and then you, you, you change the laser scanning hatch by 90 degrees, and you move a little distance in X and Y, as with every layer you're moving. So the idea in this way is that you homogenize the microstructure. There is the line scanning. There's the 45 degree line scanning. There is the 45 degree rotate line scanning, where with every layer you rotate 45 degrees. There's the 90 degree line scanning, and there's the 67 degree line scanning. Just to show you, this is how it looks like in, in our machine. So the laser would, the, the machine will divide the part into patches of laser and as you can see the laser would jump in from one layer to another to melt it and um, uh, this is basically how the part is, is is made and then at the end as you can see there is a contour laser track that just comes in to seal all the uh, edges just to improve the surface finish okay so the optimization gave us that condition that became our nominal condition that was the optimum the lowest porosity condition uh, in the case of the scanning strategy. So once we had that condition as our optimum condition, we then went on and we tried different scanning strategies. We tried the island, the so-called island parallel, where you are keeping the laser tracks parallel with each layer. There is the unidirectional strategy where the laser is just going back and forth, back and forth. And then there's the cross hatching where you are rotating at 90 degrees with every layer. So same parameters, but you're only changing the scanning strategy. 
Um, so we played also with more factors. So there are other factors that are extremely important. One of them is the islands overlap in the X and Y directions. So between each island and island, there is a level of overlap that happens between them. And that level of overlap that happens between them, you know, it's more like how the tiles are attached to one another. This is a distance, basically. We call it the A2 and A3. So these two parameters indicate how much distance do we have to overlap between those patches of material that we are melting as we go on. So we played with the scanning strategies. We played even with the overlap between those patches to see how we can control the microstructure. Um, so yes, that's the that's the, the overlap. And then we played also with the island size. So this square is the size of the island. So that island can be one millimeter, two, three, five, seven, whatever size you want it to be. Every time you change the size of the island, of course, that will affect the thermal fields because you heat up. By the time you reach the other end, that part would cool down. And then you come back. By that time, that part will cool down if your island is big. Whereas if your island is small, then the thermal heat is retained actually in, in, the, in, the, in the single island. So we looked into the effect of the island size. Well, how, how long does the laser have to travel in each of these patches um, of the build? So yeah, so I explained island overlap, island shift also with another factor, how much each island would move in or out. So usually there is a shift between each layer and another. And that can also affect the, the homogeneity of the build and the shape of the microstructure you're generating. Right, let's go into the next point. So, so that's, that's the key point we, we wanted to highlight. When we looked into those different conditions, we found that for all of these different scanning strategies, we're still getting very high density. This is just the, the melt pool picture from the top surface. So this is the unidirectional uh, scanning where the laser goes in back and forth, back and forth. This is the three millimeter island. This is the 2.5 millimeter island shift. When we cross-sectioned all of these samples, the porosity was very low. We are getting very high density anyway for all of these conditions. And that is the key thing about using Inquinel 718. This is an alloy that has a very large processing window. So there is a window for microstructural control in this alloy. The same, by the way, can be found in alloys like 316L or even titanium 64. You have a large window to control the microstructure if you want to do so. Now, how do we get, do a quick assessment of the texture? So we've done a very quick test. Usually, when you do X-ray diffraction, this is the powder, for instance. So this is Inquinal 718 powder. As you can see, the, the typical characteristic peak is that the 111 peak is very high when you have the powder, followed by the 002 peak, followed by the 022 peak, and so on. But then when you make something powder into solid by SL, by additive manufacturing, by LPBF, you will you are likely to get a very high 002 peak. And that's because the material, a cubic material, has the 001 direction, or 001 planes are the direction of the favored growth direction in, in, in these alloys, so uh, in cubic materials. So you end up having a much stronger 002 peak intensity in this case. So what we have been doing is that we simply would divide the intensity of the 002 peak over the intensity of the 11 peak, and we use that as an indication of the texture. So we just try to do a very quick test in this case by using X-ray diffraction. You can see here, this is the, another condition, the four millimeter island. And as you can see here that the 002 peak is not, is high, but is not, is not like in the case of the nominal condition where the O2 is very, very high. So that here indicates potentially something different in the microstructure. And we try to plot all of these relations between the intensity of the O2 peak to the intensity of the 111 peak, and the results are going to come in a second. That's just another condition. And you can see here the, how the O2 peak became very strong compared to the 111 peak uh, uh, in the three millimeter island condition. So how does it look like? So the texture coefficient, as we called it, is the ratio between the 002 peak intensity divided by the 111 peak intensity. And the first factor we looked into was the energy density. So all of these conditions in Inquinal 718, they have very high uh, density, very low porosity can be found in these conditions. But what you can see is that that texture coefficient will vary 
where you have your most texture condition, where you have a lot of columnar grains, most likely is going to be at such a high energy density. So as you increase the power, you do get a slight increase in, in, the, uh, uh, in the texture coefficient. When you increase the when you decrease the hatch spacing, which was another factor, there was another moderate effect. So if you're comparing those three conditions, this is the change in texture due to the uh, change in the um, uh, hatch spacing, the overlap essentially between the layers. But if you decrease the speed, you get that effect. So this was 2,000 millimeter per second, 1,500 millimeter per second, and you can see that there is for us, for the same laser power. And as you can see that the texture goes uh, very high, or the texture coefficient to be precise goes very high. Now we've done now the same comparison, but in this case with the different scanning parameters. And I want you to keep an eye on the texture coefficients here because the maximum increase we had was from, let's say 1.7 to around 5.5, let's say texture coefficient. Whereas when we moved into the scanning strategy, we had from 1.7, which is that condition here, and the powder is there, by the way, just to show you how the powder is when you do the texture coefficient, to something which goes up to eight. Eight, very, very high texture coefficient. You know, the peak is just a very strong 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.002 peak divided by the 1.1 peak, very high ratio between them. So that's our, the island perpendicular, that's our nominal condition. This is what people typically would manufacture and they say we have a good condition that's the standard parameters the standard scanning strategy that's the one that the people typically use so whereas as you can see below that there are less textured conditions and above that there are more textured conditions in fact and you can see it yes if you <clears throat> do just a quick check between the, the the two conditions one of them is just very columnar grains you know grown from the top to the bottom and then the other one is just very fine grains but of course, optical microscopy doesn't show much, so we had to go to EBSD now to check how do they compare like with EBSD. And that's one of the first effects that we, we are reporting today. So the, the, the effect of the uh, island size. So that's the island size. We try different islands, three millimeter islands, five millimeter islands and seven millimeter islands. And you remember me saying something about going back and forth and you start from here, it cools down and you come back. So obviously, as your uh, island size becomes bigger, that means that the laser travels a larger distance. So one end will cool down and then you come back to cool down. Whereas if you have a small island, like a three millimeter island, then you're likely to retain the heat and that usually results in coarser grains. So <clears throat> we've looked into the grain size and you can see obviously that the three millimeter islands have a much coarser grain. That's along the build direction, of course. You can see that the, the grain um, uh, size, the grain size is a little bit bigger. We've also looked into the cell size by looking into the solidified microstructure. And then we correlate that with data from the literature for Inquinal 718 to know roughly the cooling rate of different conditions and how they, they would compare. Um, and then we used the, the equations like this one, which correlates the cell size with the um, uh, cooling rate. So there are some empirical equations in the literature for um, for Inconel 718 and for other nickel super alloys, where you can correlate the dendrite arm spacing, secondary dendrite arm spacing or the cell size with the cooling rate. And what we see is that changing from, let's say from three to five millimeter, that results in doubling the cooling rate. And then from five to seven, there isn't that much difference between them in the cooling rate. So there, there is obviously a critical cooling rate size beyond which it becomes actually, you don't see much difference in the microstructure or you don't see much difference in the solidified microstructure. Now we had to go to our colleagues now in ESI, our co-authors, Mustafa Megayed and colleagues, to try to help us to simulate the process. So the, 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 the problem in solidification modeling is that it's too complicated for something like additive manufacturing where we have very high cooling rates. So <clears throat> one problem <clears throat> they had was that first of all, they had to tweak and calibrate the parameters of solidification and in a melt pool so let's say what you're seeing here there, there is a melt pool at a different you know time steps so from here to the to the bottom there and what you're seeing here is that they try to tweak the uh, density of nuclei so ng is the nuclei density and that's in a sense is in full entity that's the fudge factor here you're trying to 
to do. You're trying to uh, understand a problem which is very difficult to relate. So you try different assumptions. And then based on these different assumptions of the nucleation density, we went on and we tried to calibrate that by experiment. So they're basically they did different process parameters, or we did for them different process parameters, and they tried to, cal to correlate their observations of two single tracks, as you can see here. So this is one laser track, and that's the laser second laser melt pool. We tried to correlate that with the experiment to basically try to find out the nucleation density with or to, to fit the nucleation density, which is the which is a, a quite a major assumption in predicting grain growth when you try grain size when you try to simulate um, additive manufacturing. Now they repeated the analysis now for different scanning strategies and to some to some extent, yeah, we overall the, the colors you're seeing there in front of you is only indication of the grain size. It's not an indication of texture or anything like that. You can potentially obtain the texture, but it will be very complicated by modeling. So they basically calculated the, the, the size of the grains for different scanning strategies, for different island size. So this is the one millimeter island, three millimeter island, and seven millimeter island. And the initial results in, 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 in some way suggest that, yes, you probably have coarser grains, larger grains, longer grains, extending from the bottom to the top in the smaller scanning strategies. And then when you go into the um, uh, large scan, large island size, the grains become smaller. Now I have to admit the the this is only our first attempt, so it's it still I think needs a lot of improvement in the ability to calculate or simulate or estimate the nucleation density in order to be able to do something which is you know literally very good from a, a, an experimental validation point of view compared to what we get from the literature. Right. What else did we try? So we looked into the island shift. Uh, the, the following slides are all nice, colorful EBSD slides. So, so you will see, in a sense, the colors and the difference in, 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 in grain size can show you a stark difference. Again, two different conditions, exactly the same, were very high density, not, a, not much porosity at all in these materials. But you can see a com comparison between finer grains, nice colors, nice distribution of textures to, in general, a more textured condition and that's related to the shift of the islands. So what the distance between the patches that they, the, the laser would move with every island and every following subsequent layer. So if you're doing a four millimeter shift, if you're moving far away, the heat is going to be obviously displaced with you. And that results in finer grains. Whereas when you're doing it with one millimeter shift, the heat is retained to some extent. So you end up continuing seeding on the same previous texture and also keeping the heat in the build. So that's basically the, the concept of the island shifters in a more colorful way. So that's layer one, that's layer two, that's layer three. So that's the X, Y movement of the um, of the island with every layer. And you can see a stark difference between them in the texture and in the shape of the microstructure. Now, one other thing we tried was that our machine in Birmingham can have, uh, we can heat the bed. So we, we modified the machine to uh, be able to heat the, the, plat the, the substrate. And the outcome again is some differences we can see here. So this is the optimum condition, nice optimum condition, but then we switched on the heat in the bed. And as you can see, there is some indications of recrystallization happening, still waiting to be confirmed, but there is some indication of recrystallization happening compared, to, uh, and, and coarser grains, of course, compared with the case of the as fabricated condition without the heat. So the thermal effect that we have in the build can potentially also lead to other potential benefits in terms of unifying the grain structure, getting getting a more equi grain structure or so on, if the temperature can be tweaked to an acceptable level to initiate nucleation or to initiate, sorry, uh, recrystallization. Now, the key thing is that Inconel 718, as you know, is is a heat treatable Inconel, is a heat treatable super alloy. So you must heat treat it. So when you look into it in the as fabricated condition, you find lovely niobium rich rubbish on the cell boundaries. So these things, we don't like them. They, they are a mixture of delta with labis and all sorts of other things that along the boundaries. So we need to homogenize that microstructure. The problem here is that if you go into a very violent homogenization treatment, you will basically destroy your grain structure 
and we want to see if we can retain the grain structure. And the good news is that, so we've done the solution treatment of Inconel 718, which is at 980, water quenched, and followed by the double aging. So that's the that's the standard heat treatment in, in nickel super alloys. So 980 is, is, is all right, it's not, too, it's not too hot. The good news, the really, really good news is that the microstructure has been retained. So, or, or if you look into comparing the grain structure, the as-built structure versus the solution-treated and aged structure, the microstructure has been retained. So we did manage to bring back the, dense, the, the, the strength of the material, dissolve all the solidification byproducts. All of that niobium has gone back into solution, and we have now a uniform microstructure with high strength into it. So now we moved into the final step of this of this initial investigation. Can we now make a component which has two different microstructures? So instead of writing EPSRC or something like that on our uh, on a blade, we decided to um, uh, to build a blade that has two different microstructures. And basically, we used the two extreme conditions we have. On the bottom there, we used the four millimeter island shift. And on the top there, we used the three millimeter island size with an interface between them. And the blade was built, as you can see, two different microstructures, two different microstructures, different grain sizes. And of course, more interestingly, different texture. So you can see here that the blade itself has a very strong 001 texture, as you can see, which of course will have other impact on, in, on modulus and other factors. Um, and the, uh, the, the blade itself, the third tree root itself, it does have a strong uh, 001 orientation still, but the grain size is different. So in a sense, if you, if you master these rules of grain size control and texture control, you can use them to your benefit and components and can be built like this one in the future where you can have dual microstructures directly. Then you can expose them to the heat treatment and when you expose them to the heat treatment, the grain structure can be retained, and that, of course, can have benefits later on in other uh, applications. Now, what can we do? Now, the next step is to do mechanical testing. So we looked into different mechanical testing combinations. We have done grading of conditions from one end to the other. We've done dual microstructural grading, and we've done also complex dual grading, where we have done interlocking microstructures. So we built a microstructure that looks like the basically ball and socket. So this is the one with the ball and then the socket from the other end, just because it was fun to do so, to try to see if that gives any benefit in, 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 uh, in achieving uh, good mechanical behavior. So this is an example of the dual microstructure. And yes, we do get a difference between, between the two sides. So uh, there is a difference between the two sides, as you can see. And Next step, moved into digital image correlation to do mechanical testing. I'm not going to go into too much details because this is still work in, in, in progress, but you can see how the two different parts, they differ in the way they strain. And of course, the fracture happened at what one of the ends. So you do get that kind of differential microstructure if you want to do so. And this is the interface between the two uh, sides of the samples. Okay, now, Part of the work which is ongoing, just to, to indicate, is that we have also looked into the influence of that microstructure control on oxidation resistance. There was a paper published in 2014 by uh, Dong Dong Gu from Nanjing University, where he looked into the influence of the heat input on the oxidation behavior. And he was able to show that certain conditions, certain builds, can have a much better uh, oxidation resistance based on the microstructure, of course. I mean, it's in a sense, it's complex because it, it's based on the grain size, the texture, and the chemical and homogeneity of the samples. So some of our initial work, which is what you see here, looked into oxidation uh, resistance. And again, what we're seeing here is that we're getting a lot of different conditions with different oxidation resistance that we are still struggling to explain. So one condition, the four millimeter shift, the top one, which has very fine grains, has a very high oxidation resistance on the X has gain on the uh, YZ, the, the XZ phase, which is that one, compared with the X, the three millimeter island, which is getting very high, very high oxidation is happening here on the XY plane, which is the top one, and then a little bit lower happening on the XZ. So we're still 
doing more work on the oxidation resistance, but we can see the potential of even being able to not just layer the material from the inside, but even layer it from the outside, from the skin, to give us good corrosion resi oxidation resistance um, in, in its uh, behavior. So in conclusion, um, texturing can be increased, decreased, controlled by, screen, by the scan strategy and the laser parameters, and of course the grain size. And of course, the, the, the highest and lowest text, texturing effect especially was obtained when we controlled the island scan strategy by changing the shift and changing the size of the islands. You, you saw that we tried to, to find a heat treatment that does not remove the texture, only is used to dissolve carbides or, or niobium-based phases, but then retain the grain structure at the end. Um, and then after that, the grade structures, structure, microstructures were produced with different scanning strategies. And as an outcome, we saw that it does have an impact on the mechanical and the oxidation behavior, but that's still ongoing and uh, yet to be uh, assessed. And I guess I've done around 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop here to give some time for questions. And maybe if Jessica allows me at the end, I can I can give like five minutes of view about my group just to see if that uh, can help with some collaborations. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, we now take questions. Does anyone want to chip in? Okay. Someone has a question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Motas and Jessica. Um, thank you very much again, Motas, for a very nice uh, and very interesting talk. Uh, clearly has a lot of work has been done um, since the, the last time you gave the lecture to the to the theme. Um, my, my, my question is when you only selected about the hour one big mm. and normalized that with one 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 big. Mm. Um, we, are, we know for the cubic normally we have a strong over one uh, but sometimes we see the O11 also increase yeah it's in particular for like a 316L or other FEC alloys as well. So, so my, my curiosity is, have you also looked into O11 pick to see whether, I mean, not like O11 is increased, but also O increased to some certain extent that might be lower the texture for O01. Um, yeah. 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 So right, very, just very good question. Very good question. Yes, uh, indeed. We, 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 the, the, the thing is that at the initial stage of uh, looking into columnar growth, we looked mainly into these two peaks. But then we also looked into the uh, 022 peak. The problem is that we could not see clearly effects. You know, we saw just scatter of data, and it's potentially because the, the intensity is very low anyway. So we did not see a clear effect, uh, but we did look into it. I think XRD, as you know, as a, as a way of doing a quick assessment of texture is, is, not the, 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 is not something very detailed like EBSD, where you can see then the the zero one one peak, which which you are right in in cubic materials, we still see some, you know, strange effects sometimes mm. with different conditions. Um, the the way that if we wanted to do this thing again, and we had access to more time on EBSD, we would have probably scanned all the conditions, compared the texture components for all conditions, and then we can see how the uh, solidification behavior is affected by, um, or, or how these different orientations are affected by the different conditions. But we wanted something quick, and that's why XRD was potentially the quickest way of doing that assessment. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, thank you very much, Motaz. May I have another question? Um, about one, one trend we see that when you increase energy density, we know that we provide more heat, that's more residual temperature. Mm. So that might promote more columnar and, and also bigger grains as well. But um, do you think if we can increase in particular, that's, one discussion we, we met before the, the talk is if you melt and remelt, mm. that is you can promote more kind of selection of grains. So that um, that would lead to kind of more columnar or even towards Sing the very few number of grains. And, yeah. and, and ideally for a single grain, uh, mm. for example. Do, do you think that is a sensible one to to, to go and to explore? Uh, certainly, I mean, never get to a single grain, but yeah. let's, let's say it's like, a, directional grains like in, in, in two by blades where people want to minimize grain boundaries. I, I, I think it, it, it's, I've, I've seen that and double melting, triple melting, all of that. And I think it's, it potentially will, will, will produce, will, can potentially produce 
um, some further coarsening of the grains. The the I think from the problem with our machine, what we noticed is that if you do double melting for every layer, that slows down the build a lot. So that was the only concern we had, and uh, in a sense, it would have also complicated the program if you're trying to do put the the, the build file. Mm. So, um, but I, I personally, we have not looked into that uh, in this study. We tried to look mainly into scanning strategies and, as you saw, the bed temperature as well, as well as the heat input. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Motas. Um, yeah. I, I could have, I would love to have more questions, but I think I just keep. Oh, we will call. We'll call me yeah. anytime. That's okay, yeah. son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Gladly. Hello. Nice I just time. wanted to say uh, thank you um, and thank you for uh, for giving a seminar today. Gladly. This was uh, very interesting. You work on oxidation, right, or something related? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, so that's the thing. So if you if you want to control oxidation, let me know. We probably have some clever tips to uh, to see what we can do. Yeah, that would be interesting. Actually, there's quite a bit of potential for collaboration. I'm doing quite a lot of work on super alloys and also on like uh, optimizing microstructure and the effect of alloying additions on microstructure. So there's definitely lots of potential for future collaborations. Brilliant. Just give me a call anytime. I mean, obviously, we, we have been looking into publishing more papers with Imperial. We we have done some work recently on XPS uh, with um, with you through the Henry Royce Institute with one of my postdocs, yeah. and also uh, with Sun Fam. We hope we, we hope to publish a couple of papers in the future with Alessandro. So uh, we're working on that as well. So do let do let us know. We are we are now back. So I think one of the things that I will probably try to say in the in the last five minutes, I'll just give a quick sh sh you know tour about our current projects because we. Um, we can make the samples interesting. That's the thing. I mean, we, what we what we see is that people would simply make samples, do the mechanical testing, do oxidation. But actually, for every material, there is potentially a large spectrum of properties and microstructures you can obtain using just tweaking the parameters. So that's that's I think is where the holy grail of additive manufacturing can be. Yeah, it would be quite interesting. There's also I'd be quite interested in looking at op oxygen uptake as well. Um, it can affect the properties a lot, and yeah, it'd be interesting for additive manufacturing, especially. We, we right. published a report recently on uh, how we can use oxygen uptake to our benefit, where we can basically end up having an ODS in situ made by additive manufacturing. That so, if, if really you use a, yeah, if you use an unclean gas, basically, if you use an argon with some oxygen or even with some nitrogen or carbon, people have looked into doing that to be able to create ODS in situ. So what's uh, what's the species that oxidized? So in in that material, it was manganese oxide. It was a high entropy alloy with o basically ODS high entropy alloy, where the uh, manganese oxidized. In some other materials, you can add yttria, you can add other elements that are likely to oxidize. Yeah, 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 definitely. Sounds good. <laughs> um, do do anyone else have any questions? I think Alessandro. I think there's one hand up. Yeah. Ciao, Alessandro. Hi, Moatis. It's Hi. nice to meet you finally in person, in a way. Well, not really in person, but almost. Thank you for the very nice talk and very yep. nice work by you and Bonnie. Yep. I guess you showed a lot of work on your on the effect of what I would call the interlayer cooling time on the texture on grain size. Um, and you also mentioned all of the phases that you get at the cell boundaries mm. that you don't want the carbides. Mm. I'm just wondering if you looked at how the different uh, island sizes and different island shifts, uh, how they affected the, that, those phases at the cell boundaries, and then if the same heat treatment would work on all the different uh, processing windows that you selected. Yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 real problematic element in in Inconel 17 really is niobium. That's the that's this is the most problematic one. It goes into cell boundaries, segregates. So um, the good thing though is that 980 or you know that solution treatment is enough basically to dissolve most of the niobium. Now the 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 one that you you're right. Some conditions might give you even more problematic ones like the lavas, for instance. Yeah. Which then will be more problematic to dissolve. So that's that's the thing. 
Yeah, and I and I was thinking also. I, I know the grain you showed EBSDs that obviously show grain size, but yes. what we're also interested in is subgrain cell size because then you'll have segregation along those cells boundaries. So I was wondering if you've looked at actually subgrain cell size because that would affect the distribution of secondary phases. And then again, yeah. I'm not sure the same heat treatment would work for different. Yeah, let me let me just flash one of the one of the slides. I think I've I've shown some bits on that. Um, so we did measure the cell sizes in all conditions. Uh, we again, just for the sake of the time, we ca I kept only the, the the most relevant ones. Yeah, of course. So, it's so, so okay. here here you can see this is these are all measured cell size values. Right. Yeah. So so we did measure the cell size. I think if if I go back to the if I go next now to the next to the slide where I showed the heat treatment, uh, where is the heat treatment? Yeah, that's that's the one. So Bonnie basically she went into the men pools trying to quantify the size of these cells. And as you can see, when you do the, the solution treatment, you still get some rubbish still left along the boundaries. You you see that it's not a fantastic cleaning process. You yeah. still get some of them. But then but then if you if you want to get them all dissolved, if you want to clean everything, you, you then have to go much higher in temperature. And much higher in temperature means that you're going to uh, basically destroy your grain structure. Essentially, you, you're going to, all that grain structure that you worked very hard to create is going to disappear. So you look into the current ASTM standards on additive manufacturing of Inconel 718, and they say, you may need to hip it. Now, if you hip this alloy now, well, all your effort in microstructure control is gone, yeah. and you're, you're back again to square one. We, have, um, on, on a different material, not on this one, we published the report where we looked into the influence of uh, heat treatment. So it's interesting, very interesting. If you go to very like um, intense heat treatments, you may actually strengthen the texture. You may strengthen the texture. You may grow the grains and yeah. even further strengthen the texture. Yeah, actually, I, I think that's what happened to, to my Inconel 7A samples. When I, it's funny because the heat treatment route was quite similar to yours, not quite the same. Yeah. But then I didn't get, when I went very high magnification, I still saw very small precipitates or carbides or whatever yeah, it's yeah. still. Yeah. And so I did see a grain growth. So there was some microstructure modification. But yeah, yeah, very interesting. We should definitely follow up on that. No, gladly, gladly. We'll be, we'll be very keen to, to help and produce some interesting samples for you. Yeah. Thank you again for the talk. Gladly. I think if I can get two minutes, I don't know if there's somebody else got another question, or if so, if no one has another question, so I can just go for two minutes, and we can include there just to show you um, uh, essentially what we have been up to, and uh, use this as my concluding note. Um, so this is our um, this is the lab, which I guess some of you might have visited. Um, we, we do have a, a large number of facilities. We've got blown powder or DLD systems, uh, which is currently printing, by the way, in Conal 718 and CM247. Uh, got multi-wire DLD systems, which are used for alloy development. Um, we've got a, a large bed SLM solutions machine for uh, uh, printing aluminium. We've got our concept laser machine, that's the workhorse of the lab. And we have a hip, we have an atomizer, um, plus some heat treatment facilities. The current workforce of the lab around maybe um, 20 something uh, people in the lab. We st the current projects look into aerospace alloys, high entropy, uh, nickel super alloys and cobalt super alloys. There are projects in the motor racing front and then uh, projects on the space front where we do a lot of work on space actually with ESA, European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency on niobium alloys. Not sure if anybody works in niobium, but if you are, get in touch, it's very interesting and um, low CTE alloys like aluminium, silicon, and invar. And then in defense, we do a lot of work on uh, functioning graded materials by hipping and additive manufacturing. Um, we did then have a couple of programs on medical front, so we've been printing stents. That's been one of our uh, EPSC programs. And printing low modulus titanium alloys, so beta alloys essentially. And then finally, we've been doing a lot on magnetic materials recently. So printing soft magnets, printing magnetocaloric materials that are materials that change temperature when you apply a magnetic field. 
and then magnetic smart materials that will move when you apply a magnetic field into them. And then more recently, ceramics 3D printing uh, using a new machine that we acquired recently in, in Birmingham. Um, the activities, if I can go maybe to the next slide, into the one on um, nickel super alloys. This is just an, a quick overview about our nickel work. So I've been doing a lot of optimization of different materials. This is the full list of materials from the most difficult to the easiest. Uh, more work on microstructure control, work on heat treatment and post-processing, work on uh, microstructure development and how it happens, and work where we combine additive manufacturing with hipping. That's on the nickel front. On the aluminium front, we've been doing a lot of work on different interesting aluminium alloys like A2X. Uh, this is a new aluminium alloy doing work on heat treatment and post-processing of these alloys and how we can control the fatigue life. Um, work on lattices, which is very interesting uh, to control shocks or so. And then again, more work on microstructure development. Then currently on titanium, uh, work on additive manufacturing of beta alloys, heat treatment, post-processing, more lattices again from uh, titanium 6.4. And then last but not least, this is now the thing that is keeping me busy most of the time. I've been doing a lot of work on functional materials and functional structures. So we, we've had a large problem looking into soft magnetic materials. These are materials that are, are used for magnetic shielding. Very interesting material, very interesting project. Uh, I mentioned the work we did on INVAR and the low CTE materials. And then work on shape memory alloys work on heat pipes for cooling and for uh, um, thermal management in hot structures, work on printing radio frequency devices, which, uh, which is another interesting one, and work on refractories uh, together with uh, the people at Column looking into tungsten, tantalum and other elements, as well as work on niobium for space, and then finally on drug delivering implants, uh, basically drugs that leak drugs, uh, implants that leak drugs from, from inside. So that's just a quick overview. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to send the, those slides to uh, um, to Jessica just to send them around. But if anybody happens to be uh, interested in any of these materials, just give me a shout, and hopefully we can make some samples for you and uh, get a couple of papers published or so. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Son, did you have a question? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you very much, Stella. Well, that's a quick question about the functional and but also the ship memory alloy. Um, so first of all, about ship memory alloy, is it possible to maintain the same composition and maintain the same functionality like a ship memory capacity after 3D printing? Because I mean the the, the range of composition for to, to, to maintain that functionality is very narrow, isn't it? And we know in additive manufacturing that might change the composition a little bit. Um, so, so have you tested about the, the the memory capacity of the alloy after 3D printing? The the alloy will need heat treatment. That's the key thing, because you again when you do the solidification, you have a lot of solidification byproducts, a lot of intermetallics form. So you must dissolve them, and uh, obviously dislocation. So you must clean all of that by heat treatment. The second problem is that in uh, some elements, like in the case of nickel titanium, nickel will selectively evaporate from the alloy and that will drop your nickel content and it will shift your phase transformations. So again, you must actually start with an alloy of nickel 52, titanium 50, titanium 48 to end up with a nickel titanium 50, 50 alloy, which is the alloy you want to be dead on. Uh, it, it's not easy, <laughs> no, it's not easy. There are a lot of ifs and buts and things to do to be able to get the right performance at the end. Yeah. You're, you're muted. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I'm still on mute. Um, yeah. and the, the next question is about the functional materials like magnetism, magnetic mm -hmm. materials. Uh, one one thing, uh, one area I think we we haven't explored enough is the kind of writing the 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 properties, the specific location. So not only about the functional but also structural properties mm -hmm. and combined between kind of magnetism and the grain tailoring. So like mm. a grain size and, and grain texture as well. So we can write the, the properties, both structural and functional properties, to specific location, like mm. the writing in, in like in programming. Yeah. Uh, 
that's I think that's one area we we, we should explore further uh, as a community. And there are papers in uh, in medical implants field where they have managed to control the elastic modulus locally uh, in medical implants in order to reduce the stress shielding. So you can, by heat input in titanium, you can control locally the, the modulus to get it down to 70 maybe, or you know 80 in some beta alloys locally. Um, whereas in the case of, um, of ma magnetic materials, the problem with magnetic materials, especially the uh, soft, for instance, the soft magnets, soft magnets, you need to be able to tailor the magnetic axis which is the, the easy access for magnetization. So sometimes actually your, your target is to control to be able to get the easy access. That's your ultimate target. Otherwise, your magnetic properties will be inferior. So um, th this is the, the, the our recently published paper where we tailor the magnetic properties just by focusing on getting the soft access right. So locally can be tricky, can be tricky, but it, it's because you, you basically have to keep moving the soft access to be conformal to your magnetic fields. But do you think if we can control the grain texture, because the grain texture would affect the um, the magnetism uh, domain? So that by doing that, if we can control the grain size and grain texture to specific location, by doing that we can control the magnetic domains, hence the magnetic uh, magnetic properties. The soft soft magnets, yes, soft magnets. This is the, the grain size, of course, and all of these things can be done. We have been struggling a lot to print hard magnets, the neodymium iron boron. Mm -hmm. They're not easy, <laughs> very, very difficult to print. And uh, the magnetic shape memory materials, they are printing, but they pick up a lot of oxygen, which is not good. So again, we're, this is the difficulty we're having with them. The um, magnetic caloric materials, again, are very brittle. So they, they are been breaking a little bit. Every material has its own complexity. I think soft magnets are easy. If you have a, a, an application that needs soft magnets, we have the capability to control the grains. We have the capability to control the grain size, I mean, and also control the grain texture uh, because they are much easier to process than the other materials. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you, Motas, again. Gladly. Yes, Hello. So thank you for organizing the talk. Um, it was been interesting, and I hope um, a lot of people will um, find it interesting as well. Um, it's past 11 now, so I'm just going to um, end by saying thank you, and um, that um, this session is being recorded, so I will edit it. Um, and thank you, Jessica, for the invitation. Thank you all. Stay safe, and I expect to get. Uh...